This video looks at back titrations, an introduction to how they work, and also a worked example of how to carry out a calculation for a back titration. So what is a back titration? In a standard titration, we're relying on the fact that we have two chemicals, A and B, which react together and make products. And in a standard titration, for example, if we wanted to know the concentration or the number of moles of B, then we would use a known substance A and we would add A to B, a solution of A to a solution of B, until a visible end point of a reaction occurred. This could be self-indicating, for example, some redox titrations have a colour change, but usually we would use this for an acid-base titration and we would use an indicator to tell us how much we've added and when we've added the right amount. We then use the balanced equation. Now this only works if our acid and our base are both water soluble. Now acids are always water soluble because otherwise they wouldn't behave as acids, but there are plenty of examples of things that react with acids that don't dissolve in water. And for that, we might instead need to use a back titration. So in a back titration, we still have two chemicals which react together, but we can't react them together in a titration. That could be because, as we've just mentioned, one of them is not soluble in water, in which case we cannot make a standard solution for which we can sort of measure the volume. Alternatively, it could simply be that they just don't react together, like they don't actually produce anything as products that would give us a visible change in a titration. So option one for a back titration is we add an excess of A to B. So we carry out some sort of reaction that's not a titration because we're adding more A than we need. We're not adding exactly the right amount. And we then have some leftover A because we know how many moles of A we added. We can titrate the A, the acid usually, and then find out how many moles are left over. And then we can work out how much must have reacted with B that way. And that's the example we're gonna look at mostly in this video. Option two, is to again add an excess of A to B to produce some sort of product, either C or D, which we can react with another substance. And this is the basis of iodine thiosulfate titrations. So many redox reactions, you can have a lot of things which will react with iodide ions to make iodine. And iodine is a chemical that I can titrate with another chemical thiosulfate in a very reliable kind of titration that gives us a very clear end point. That would be the focus of a separate video. So let's have a look at an example method using option one, which is adding an excess and then finding out how much of that excess acid is left over. So we said that we could do this for an insoluble solid, such as calcium carbonates. Now, if I knew that this was pure calcium carbonate, there'd be no need to do this titration because if I know it's pure calcium carbonate, I can weigh it and I know exactly how many moles I have. So we would use this method for an impure sample of a solid. I'm gonna weigh out my solid so that I know exactly how much I've got. But of course, it's not all calcium carbonate, and that's the point of doing the titration. Calcium carbonate doesn't dissolve in water, so I can't make a standard solution and take a sample out and simply, you know, titrate it directly with an acid. But calcium carbonate does react with acid. When I chuck it in, it will bubble. I'm going to use excess acid. At this point, it's important that I know the volume and the concentration of the acid used because from that I can work out my initial moles of acid. After I've done that 
and all the calcium carbonates reacted. Because I've used an excess, there's going to be some acid left over in that beaker. But I'm not just going to take a sample out of that beaker because right now I'm not exactly sure what the volume of that sample is. Whereas what I really want for a titration is a good, accurate volume measurement so I can work out a much more clear idea of how many moles are involved. So I would then transfer that solution, that acid, leftover acid, into my volumetric flask. So in that solution, I mean, I've got some calcium chloride, depending on the acid I use, if I use hydrochloric acid, but that's not going to affect my result. It's only the leftover acid that I'm actually going to be measuring out. So in here, I would have my leftover acid, and I'd be able to make that up to an accurate volume, either to 100 or 250 normally in a volumetric flask. Give that a shake, add distilled water to make it up to the line, give it a shake like you would in a standard titration to make any kind of solution. I can then take out samples of that. We never titrate usually our whole thing. We normally take out samples so that we can carry out a rough and do several different titrations so that we get a average of our concordant readings. So then I can titrate with a standard solution of an alkali, such as sodium hydroxide. So when I've done that, I will know in each of the samples I take out, which will be the same amount each time, 10 centimeter cubed or 25 centimeter cubed using a pipette, I will know how many moles of alkali I used in the titration because I have a known concentration and I can measure the volume in the burette. This means I know the moles of acid in my sample. I can scale this up and work out the moles of acid in that whole volumetric flask. That's my leftover acid. And because I know how many moles of acid I started with, the difference is the amount that reacted with the calcium carbonate. And from that, I can go back to working out how many moles of calcium carbonate there are. Let's look at an example. So this is a real experiment. In fact, this is real experimental results that I did with my students last year. So eggshell contains calcium carbonate, but it's not obviously pure calcium carbonate. There are some other parts of eggshell. So this experiment is finding out the percentage by mass of calcium carbonate in some eggshells. So in this typical titration, obviously we have a mass of a solid recorded. And it's then, it says dissolved um, in 25 centimeter cubed of one molar HCl, although actually it's reacting, it's not dissolving. You would see some fizzing with the carbon dioxide given off at this point. Then we put in our excess solution in a volumetric flask, and this time we're making it up to 250 centimeter cubed with distilled water. So I've got a volume of my flask, and then in it, just like in any titration, I take out about a tenth of that, or exactly a tenth, 25 centimeter cubed with a pipette. And then we titrated that with sodium hydroxide and we've been given an average titer value. Of course, we might have to work that out from a table. So from this, we've been asked to calculate percentage by mass of calcium carbonate in that Excel sample. So for that, I'll need to know but for mass of calcium carbonate, to work out percentage, to work that out, I will need to know moles of calcium carbonate. I didn't directly titrate the calcium carbonate, but I did react it with acid. So for that, I would need to know moles of HCl reacted. And I get that from two values. I get it from the moles of HCl at the start that I had in my beaker beforehand. And then I have my moles of HCl in the flask. And I get my moles of HCl in the flask from my titration. So just like any other big long titration, 
question, I'm going to work backwards. So I'm going to sort of start at the titration end, work out moles and then step backwards through all of them. And I may also need, of course, to think about balanced equations as I'm going along in order to get the right relationship between the moles of one thing and the moles of another. So let's work this out. We're going to start from the end of the experiment, working out moles of NaOH, because that is the first thing that I have two values for. I have a concentration and I have a volume. So, of course, I need to turn volume into decimeter cubed. At the moment, it's in centimeter cubed. So it's going to be 7.1 over 1,000 to turn centimeter cubed into decimeter cubed times my concentration is 0.1. That gives me 7.1 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of NaOH. Leave that as it is. Don't try and turn that into a decimal number. Just leave it in standard form when it's small. Then you are much less likely to go wrong. OK, the next part of the calculation relies on the balanced equation because I'm going from sodium hydroxide to HCl. Well, it turns out that sodium hydroxide reacts with HCl in a nice, easy one to one equation. And so that means that there are therefore 7.1 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of HCl in 25 centimeter cubed. So we're working backwards and at the moment we are still in the titration volumes. We're just in a conical flask, not the volumetric flask. The volumetric flask has a volume of 250. And of course it was the leftover acid, all of it went in the volumetric flask and I need to know how many moles there are in total in that volumetric flask. So for the next step, very, very common in this sort of titration question, I need to multiply that by 10 because there are 10 times as many moles in 250 as there are in 25. So that means there are 7.1 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of HCl. And that is in my volumetric flask. And that is my left over remaining moles after the reaction with calcium carbonate. Now I have to consider how many moles of acid I had originally. So my initial moles of HCl, I have a volume and a concentration. So I know that I have 25 centimeter cubed, one molar acid. So my initial moles is 25 over 1000 times one gives me 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2. So now I need to calculate the difference between those two values, because the difference is what reacted with my calcium carbonate. Just going to move on so that we have a bit more space to finish this calculation off. So the moles of HCl that reacted is going to be my initial number of moles, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2, minus the moles that ended up in that volumetric flask, which we calculated as 7.1 times 10 to the minus 3. And that is going to give me 0.01 seven nine moles of HCl. So I have worked out sodium hydroxide in the titration, worked out HCl in the conical flask in the 25 centimeter sample, then scaled it up to 250 and then found the difference between that and the HCl that the calcium carbonate reacted with. So that means that 0 0.0179 moles of HCl reacted with the calcium carbonate in my initial sample of 0 0.997 grams. Now we want to convert this to moles of calcium carbonate, so we need to use the balanced equation. 
balanced equation CaCO3 reacts with 2 HCl to make calcium chloride, H2O and CO2. If you're still a bit stuck on writing your balanced equation for acids and uh, bases, then have a look at my YouTube playlist on different types of reaction and writing equations for them. OK, so calcium carbonate, one mole reacts with two of acid. I've got the moles of acid and I need to go back into moles of carbonate. So I've got to divide it by two. So my moles of calcium carbonate is 0 0.0. 179 over 2, which is equal to 8.95 times 10 to the minus 3. I now want to know my mass of calcium carbonate. So that's going to equal moles, which I've got here, times by MR. The MR is 100.1. So I do 8.95 times 10 to the minus 3 times 100.1, which gives me 0 0.896 grams. That's good. That's a sensible answer because it's less than 0 0.997, uh, but it is also like quite close to that value because I don't want a crazy answer like 0 0.0896 or something like that, which I might have got if I'd made a mistake earlier on. So to find my percentage by mass, it's just the mass of calcium carbonate I have over the total mass of the sample times 100, and it equals 89.9%, which makes sense.